How do we understand and represent the corporeal experience of abortion, which involves blood and often pain to be sure, without ceding ground to the violent, gruesome, and gory ideas promoted by anti-abortion propaganda? Is this, should this, even be a goal of popular culture? The first time I ever saw an abortion on screen, it was in passing while staying at a friend's home. Tyler Perry's Four Colored Girls was playing on her mother's TV, and I had stepped in the room during the film's chilling abortion scene. The abortion plot follows a young dancer, played by young Tessa Thompson, who seeks a back alley abortion in secret after becoming pregnant. The woman performing the procedure is very clearly not in her right mind, botching the abortion and putting the patient in the emergency room. To make matters worse, her pregnancy is a point of contention in her family. It was a harrowing depiction of the worst case scenario for a young black girl seeking the procedure. I was about 14 at the time and though I only caught a few minutes, those few minutes intensified my fear of abortion and also scared me off from ever watching the rest of that film. At that age, I was well aware of the shameful connotations that abortion carried. The messaging was enforced implicitly and explicitly all around me, in church, at home, at school, and of course, in the media. As a young girl of color and a poor one at that, you're constantly reminded that in teen pregnancy, there are no options for you, there are no support systems for you, and you will be completely on your own. The worst fear of a daughter living under a strict roof is becoming pregnant as a teen. Just the thought could make my preteen heart stop, out of fear that I wouldn't know who to tell, what to do, or where to go. On top of that, there's this added worry that in the case you are able to secretly obtain an abortion, that it will be a botched procedure that leads to sterilization or even death. I knew in the event that I got pregnant, there was nowhere I could run to for a hug or for kind guidance. I knew the response would be ridicule, if not outright violence. Four years later, that hypothetical fear would turn into a reality for me. I was a freshman in college, just starting to pursue my degree. I had been on the pill for years and I had a very regular flow, so when I was just two days late, it was a major red flag to me. I knew I wanted an abortion right away, but I was still experiencing an overwhelming amount of emotions and anxiety. I booked the appointment at a Planned Parenthood alone for the day after Thanksgiving. Giving. I was lucky to reside in New Jersey, a state that has few restrictions in the way of abortion access compared to other areas in the country. My boyfriend at the time took me there and back, but I'd go through the process alone. We weren't on great terms and we'd part ways shortly after. I remember the day very clearly. The air was filled with freezing rain and fog, but that didn't deter horrible people from being lined up on the sidewalk with signs that suggested everyone inside the clinic were a bunch of baby killers. The internship, that movie where Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson get internships at Google, was playing in the waiting room where I was sitting long enough to catch the whole thing. I had a surgical abortion with no aesthetic, and for me personally, it was very painful. Though it was quick and a safe procedure with no complications, it still came with physical and emotional discomfort. I initially wanted to opt for the abortion pill instead, but it wasn't covered by my insurance and I couldn't afford the $500 bill. After the procedure, I told no one for a while, mostly out of fear of the response from anyone, especially my loved ones. But even though I felt fearful, I was very much relieved. My personal story is a small drop in the bucket of many, and it does not represent the full scope of people's experiences with abortion. With this video focusing on the why and how of destigmatizing abortion, I only felt it proper to begin with my own story. Let's make one thing clear from the start. 
I'm very pro-abortion. I believe in the right to our bodily autonomy. I believe any person who wants an abortion should be able to access it easily and with support systems in place. And I believe people who desire to carry the term should be fully supported in their decisions as well. It's incredibly important that we work collectively to destigmatize abortion, both on and off screen. Because of the negative stigma, people of various racial groups groups and genders are unable to speak openly about having an abortion or to even ask questions about the procedure out of fear for their own safety. The media's influence has been influential in shifting and reaffirming societal norms and their handling of abortion storylines is no different. As I've grown older, I've been fortunate enough to come across portrayals of abortion that do resonate with me. In shows like Dear White People, abortion is handled with such sincerity and honesty while never insinuating a larger question of morality. Shrill handles abortion with a nonchalantness and dark humor while revealing how fat phobia can impact someone's reproductive health. Grey's Anatomy and Jane the Virgin showcase abortion plot lines that follow ambitious women who prefer being childless for their independence and career. So with that in mind, I'll be taking a look at the roots of anti-abortion stigma in America to later examine how the media has both reaffirmed and subverted the negative connotations associated with the procedure. Today, we'll be covering part one, while the part two that will come in a few weeks will give a timeline and evolution of abortions on screen. While I'll be dissecting and analyzing how abortion has been portrayed, I am not here to suggest that my interpretations are the only valid ones. I think there are many ways to destigmatize the procedure on screen, which in my opinion requires a plethora of narratives to exist. Everyone's abortion experience will not be the same, and therefore we shouldn't be striving for media to portray abortion in one particular way. I often hear the subject spoken about in absolutes, and though I agree that the procedure should be and can be as casual as a checkup, I also want to hold space to acknowledge the abortion stories that are not that cut and dry. That being said, there are many wrong ways to depict abortion. When it comes to anti-abortion propaganda, it's all trash, like all of it. Any piece of media that attempts to tie morality and shame into overall discussions of abortion is just as trash and only further stigmatizes the procedure. But outside of those absolute truths, I'm holding space for any and all abortion stories. The goal of this video isn't to pigeonhole directors and writers or hold people to an unrealistic standard. I simply have noticed an evolution of these portrayals in the media over time, so I wanted to explore how modern depictions differ from the past and whether these changes could be seen as progress or maintaining the status quo. My name is Joe, and this is With Nuance, a visual and audio essay experience where we dissect all things media from a socio-political lens. We are now officially a podcast as well, so if you prefer to listen to analysis instead of watching, head over to your favorite streaming app to listen. Before we get started today, I just want to do some quick housekeeping. So number one, every source and resource I mentioned today will be linked in a Google Doc in the description. In that sources document, you'll find multiple articles that lay out thorough timelines of abortion rights and abortion portrayals in media. So I highly encourage giving the document a look if you have follow-up questions or thoughts. Also feel free to leave a comment if you'd like to engage in this conversation further or you have any other questions. Number two, that being said, if you're rude or nasty or condescending to me or anyone in the comments, you will get blocked. My comments section is meant to be a place for people to engage in genuine conversations and ask questions. So if you come into the comments shaming people or using offensive and derogatory remarks, like you're just getting blocked because that's just not going to fly. And particularly when it comes to this issue, I'm not going to let people come in the comments and try to make others feel bad. So that's not going to happen. Three, 
I'd like to gently reiterate the trigger warnings at the top of this video. I will be discussing some heavy topics, so if it sounds like something you don't have the capacity to watch right now, please feel free to click out. There will be no hard feelings. Protect your peace. So yeah, that being said, let's get started. My abortion happened on a Saturday. There were a few other people in the clinic room, waiting room, including one other young black girl. I overheard the clinic staff talking about her saying she had ruined her life and that's what they do. They being black girls like us. Before the procedure, I remember going in for counseling and being told that if I move forward with this pregnancy, my baby would be jacked up because the fetus was already malnourished and underweight. Being told that if I had this baby, I would wind up on food stamps and welfare. I was being talked to like trash and it worsened my shame. Afterwards, while in the changing area, I heard some girls, all white, talking about how they were told how bright their futures were, how loved their babies would be if they adopted, and that their options and their opportunities were limitless. In that moment, listening to those girls, I felt anguish. I felt like I had failed. I went home, my body ached, and I had this heavy bleeding. I felt so sick, I felt dizzy, nauseous. I felt like something was missing. I felt alone, but I also felt so resolved in my decision. Choosing to have an abortion was the hardest decision I had ever made. I, but at 18 years old, I knew it was the right decision for me. It was freeing, knowing I had options. Even still, it took long for me to feel like me again until most recently when I decided to give this speech. So to all the black women and girls who have had abortions and will have abortions, we have nothing to be ashamed of. We live in a society that has failed to legislate love and justice for us. So we deserve better, we, de we demand better, we are worthy of better. So that's why I'm here to tell my story. So today I sit before you as that nurse, as that pastor, as that pastor, as that activist, that survivor, that single mom, that congresswoman to testify that in the summer of 1994, I was raped, I became pregnant, and I chose to have an abortion. Just like slavery, anti-abortion efforts are rooted in white supremacy, the exploitation of black women, and placing women's bodies in service to men. Just like slavery, maximizing wealth and consolidating power motivated the anti-abortion enterprise. Then, just as now, anti-abortion efforts have nothing to do with saving women's lives or protecting the interests of children. Today, a person is 14 times more likely to die by carrying a pregnancy to term than by having an abortion, and medical evidence has shown for decades that an abortion is as safe as a penicillin shot, and yet abortion remains heavily restricted in states across the country. Abortion access is not just a gendered issue, and it's certainly not one that only affects cis women. An individual's ability to safely and legally terminate their pregnancy by choice is heavily influenced by their race, class, age, disability, where they live, and a variety of other factors. It's important to note that this issue is not simply about women's rights. In an article titled, Trans and Non-Binary People Get Abortions Too, Courtney Cooper writes, Trans men, non-binary, and genderqueer patients continue pregnancies, use birth control, and decide to have children or not, just like anyone else would. Unlike cisgendered individuals, members of the transgender and non-binary community face additional barriers to accessing safe and reliable healthcare, especially reproductive healthcare. Trans men, non-binary, and genderqueer patients face a variety of potential obstacles when seeking reproductive healthcare. Some of these risks include being refused medical care, being misgendered by a provider or staff member, receiving inaccurate diagnosis and care based on assumptions made by a provider, facing uncomfortable questions or potential judgment by staff, receiving medical treatment while in an uncomfortable trauma-inducing setting. 
I believe in being as inclusive in our language when discussing such complex issues, so I will frequently be going back and forth between the terms women, pregnant people, and people who give birth. But I'm not perfect, I'm not perfect, so feel free to correct me if there are more appropriate terms to use. This issue is about the right to our bodily autonomy, having free will, maintaining full control and privacy of our bodies, the overturning of Roe v. Wade and the failure of politicians to codify the decision into law will impact many communities to various degrees. The stigma surrounding abortion works in the same ways, affecting some communities worse than others. So before I go any further, I'm urging, <laughs> like I am really urging y'all, please don't bring this shit to my comments, but I am urging white feminists to think very long and very hard about the language they choose to use while fighting for a right that they have historically had access to in a way that black and brown women have not. Think deeply, okay, before you overlook the fact that the American gynecological system, I hope I said that right, was born out of the torture of black women and girls, often with the progression and sometimes the comfort of white women in mind. That is important in these discussions. And if you are not acknowledging those things, if that is not a core part of how you address abortion rights and access, then you're addressing it wrong. In an article titled, How Black Feminists Defined Abortion Rights, Kienga Imara Taylor explains, the chasm between middle-class white women's demands and aspirations and those of poor and working-class women of color began to be addressed by the emergence of black feminists in the late 60s. These women, who included Toni Cade Bambara, Frances Beale, Alice Walker, and Barbara Smith, argued that the real equality could only be achieved by expanding the parameters of what constituted reproductive justice to include the entire context within which decisions about having or not having children were made. Organizations like NOW mobilized predominantly white women to fight for abortion rights, but they often ignored or minimized the glaring issues of coerced or forced sterilizations which was critical to women of color. According to a national study conducted by Princeton University in 1970, 21% of married black women had been sterilized. As the legal scholar Dorothy Roberts has observed, the dominant women's movement has focused myopically on abortion rights at the expense of other aspects of reproductive freedom, including the right to bear children, and has misunderstood criticism of coercive birth control policies. Black American women were inhumanely experimented on by gynecologist Marion Sims, the man who's often lauded as the father of gynecology. Yet this reality is rarely ever taken into account when people push back on birth control or abortion policies. That's Patricia Loftman, a midwife of 37 years and a member of the board of directors for the American College of Nurse Midwives. When you look at um, midwifery, say in the time of, of enslavement, the midwife was actually the person who made certain that women were able to produce healthy babies. Now after um, slavery ended, she was no longer valuable because she was not making certain that there was a, a continued slave labor. I want you to meet Mrs. Mary Cooley, a midwife who lives in Albany, Georgia. Generally in the South, most of these women were black women, taking care of women, both black and poor white, uh, because of, during the days of segregation, you could not uh, access hospitals. In the mid to late 1800s, the professionalization of medicine became a major trend, and male doctors began taking control of childbirth away from female midwives. It was determined that in order to get women into the hospital, you had to get rid of these midwives who were taking care of all of these women in the home. All of these women who had been attending births all of these years, um, they were blamed for maternal deaths, infant deaths. Two days ago, a baby delivered by a midwife died when it ought to have lived. 
My examination showed that his cord got infected, and you all know what that means. Something wasn't clean. Today, Black women experience the highest rates of maternal mortality in the country, which is no doubt a reflection of the long-standing abusive medical system. For many Black people, the doctor's office is a space full of gaslighting, dismissiveness, and too frequently, it can be life-threatening. In the 50s, white scientists continued their unethical experimentation to develop the beloved birth control pill. When it began filling pharmacy shelves in the 60s, white women didn't think twice about the women in Puerto Rico who were experimented on for their benefit. In the summer of 1955, Gregory Pincus visited Puerto Rico and discovered it would be the perfect location for human trials. The island, a U.S. territory, was one of the most densely populated areas in the world, and officials supported birth control as a form of population control in the hopes that it would stem Puerto Rico's endemic poverty. There were no anti-birth control laws on the books, and Pincus was impressed with the extensive network of birth control clinics already in place on the island. There were 67 clinics dispensing existing methods of birth control, and a large group of women used their services. For Pincus, the island offered a pool of motivated candidates and a stationary population that could be easily monitored over the course of the trials. Pincus also knew that if he could demonstrate that the poor, uneducated women of Puerto Rico could follow the pill regimen, then women anywhere in the world could too. Pincus hoped that by showing Puerto Rican women could successfully use oral contraceptives, he could quiet critics' concerns that oral contraceptives would be too complicated for women in developing nations and American inner cities to use. Because America is determined to hide the most violent aspects of its history, the average American population has no idea just how many of these systems were born out of the torture of Black and Indigenous women. And other non-white women and girls have historically been forced into non-consensual abortions or sterilizations even when they wanted to keep their children. Something else to note here, Asian American and Pacific Islander people are frequently left out of these conversations as well. American believe that all Asian Americans are high-achieving immigrants with stable incomes and the comforts to prove it. In reality, however, millions of AAPI women work in low-paying jobs, face significant wage gaps, and lack health insurance. Regardless of economic status, we're force-fed toxic cocktails of racism, misogyny, and xenophobia. And like nearly every other group of American women, we support and rely on abortion access. The model minority myth masks Asian Americans' health care needs including those in reproductive health. Still more troubling, almost no national data exists on AAPI abortions. Most studies of abortion access, including those from the federal government, categorize Asian Americans merely as other. Even within the AAPI community, leading organizations rarely speak out in support of reproductive rights. Upper society's disdain for poor people has influenced abortion restrictions as well. The Hyde Amendment, passed in 1976, would bar abortions from being covered by Medicaid, federally funded health insurance for low-income folks. This amendment was passed with bipartisan support, further solidifying the norm that even when people are pro-choice, they believe certain folks should not have access to certain choices. In 1977, Rosie Jimenez became the first known victim of the Hyde Amendment. A young mother pursuing her nursing degree to improve her and her daughter's circumstances, she fled to Mexico when she found out she was pregnant to seek an abortion. Unfortunately, she passed away from the procedure. Too many women have ultimately experienced a similar fate. Today, this law still impacts folks navigating poverty and homelessness. 
People experiencing homelessness and housing instability often have worse reproductive health outcomes. They have a higher likelihood of poor pregnancy outcomes such as higher rates of preterm birth, low birth weight infants, and longer infant hospital stays. However, little is known about abortion outcomes in people without access to stable housing. Research from the San Francisco General Hospital Women's Options Center and Bixby members investigates the relationship between housing status and abortion outcomes. Reviewing records from the clinic, the researchers found that 19% of abortions were found to be among people experiencing homelessness or housing instability. When compared to those with stable housing, they were later on in their pregnancy when they had their abortion. Although abortion complications were rare as expected, people without stable housing were more likely to have abortion complications. The research suggests that arriving at the clinic later in pregnancy led to the higher rate of complications. Politicians rarely address how unhoused folks navigate abortion, so there are practically no systems in place for someone who is experiencing homelessness and does get pregnant. The Hyde Amendment also directly impacts Indigenous Americans. In a Q&A for NPR, Adrian Florido expounds on the reality for Indigenous women's reproductive rights. So when it comes to reproductive rights in Indigenous communities, body sovereignty has always been an issue since colonization. But within the last few decades, the biggest issues that have come up are around the Hyde Amendment, which bans the use of federal dollars to fund any type of abortion care services except for in three specific cases, rape, incest, or if the life of the mother is in danger. And so Indian Health Services, which is the primary facility for indigenous people and uses federal dollars, often has their hands tied when it comes to providing abortion care because IHS facilities are not equipped to offer that type of care even under those three circumstances. IHS did many forced or coerced sterilizations of indigenous women and this was a practice that went on from the 1960s to around the mid 1970s. The statistic is that one in four indigenous women during that time frame had gotten forced or coerced sterilization through IHS facilities. Arguments for the importance of birth control and sex education have long stood on the eugenicist idea idea that people of color and those living in poverty need more access to these options so they can stop procreating. In short, they use these schools of thought to place blame of the colonizer's genocide onto the innocent individuals experiencing the effects of the genocide. Abortion narratives surrounding non-white women, both non-fictional and fictional accounts, frequently stress the barriers that the mother will face if she carries to term. In contrast, messaging from government officials, journalists, and filmmakers historically encourages white women to follow through with their pregnancies. And realistically, white women are often in better positions to seek out safe, illegal abortions in the case that a legal option is not available to them. They're also less likely to be criminalized or face jail time for breaking the law. Now, this isn't to say white women can't experience violence or complications or obstacles or be villainized when it comes to the topic of abortion but the dynamics just differ dramatically for women of color the societal stigma always encourages white people to carry the term while black and brown people are encouraged to do the opposite similar to the dichotomy you'll find when addressing teen pregnancy it's almost as if this double standard is a modern reflection of eugenic principles but what do i know Regardless of the messaging, abortion access for many is often fraught with insurmountable barriers despite the federal decision of Roe v. Wade. According to the Guttmacher Institute, since the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision, states have passed more than 1,000 abortion restrictions. More than a third of them were enacted between 2011 and 2019, accelerating after the election of President Barack Obama. Let's deal with abortion. 
At what point does a baby get human rights, in your view? Well, you know, I, I think that whether you're looking at it from a theological perspective or uh, a scientific perspective, uh, answering that question with specificity, uh, you know, is is uh, above my pay grade. Uh, you, but, 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 but let me, let me, let me just speak more generally about the issue of abortion, because uh, this is something I, uh, obviously, uh, the country wrestles with. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that I'm absolutely convinced of is that there is a moral and ethical element to this issue. Uh, and so I, I think anybody who tries to deny the moral difficulties and gravity of the abortion issue, I think, is, is not paying attention. So, 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 so that'd be point number one. But point number two, uh, I am, I am pro-choice. I believe in Roe versus Wade, and, and I, I come to that conclusion not because I'm pro-abortion, mm -hmm. but because ultimately I don't think women make these decisions casually. I think they, they wrestle with these things in profound ways, in consultation with their pastors or their uh, spouses or their, their, their doctors and their family members. Mr. Trump, you're pro-life, but I, I want to ask you specifically, do you want the court, including the justices that you will name, to overturn Roe v. Wade, which includes, in fact states, a woman's right to abortion? Well, if that would happen, because I am pro-life and I will be appointing pro-life judges, I would think that that will go back to the individual states. But I'm asking you specifically, would you if like to... If they overturned it, it'll go back to the states. But what I'm asking you, sir, is do you want to see the court overturn? You just said you want to see the court protect the Second Amendment. Do you want to see the court overturn Roe Well, if we put another two or perhaps three justices on, that's really what's going to be... Ha that will happen. And that'll happen automatically, in my opinion, because I am putting pro-life justices on the court. But I want to ask you, Secretary Clinton, I want to explore how far you believe the right to abortion goes. You have been quoted as saying that the fetus has no constitutional rights. You also voted against a ban on late-term partial birth abortions. Why? Because Roe v. Wade very clearly sets out that there can be regulations on abortion so long as the life and the health of the mother are taken into account. And when I voted as a senator, I did not think that that was the case. The kinds of cases that fall at the end of pregnancy are often the most heartbreaking, painful decisions for families to make. I have met with women who, have, toward the end of their pregnancy, get the worst news one could get, that their health is in jeopardy if they continue to carry to term, or that something terrible has happened or just been discovered uh, about the pregnancy. I do not think the United States government should be stepping in and making those most personal of decisions. So you can regulate if you are doing so with the life and the health of the mother taken into account. Mr. Trump, your reaction, and particularly on this issue of late-term partial birth Well, abortion. I think it's terrible. Uh, if you go with what Hillary is saying, in the ninth month, you can take the baby and rip the baby out of the womb of the mother just prior to the birth of the baby. Now, you can say that that's okay, and Hillary can say that that's okay, but it's not okay with me. Because based on what she's saying and based on where she's going and where she's been, you can take the baby and rip the baby out of the womb in the ninth month on the final day. And that's not acceptable. Well, that is not what happens in these cases. And using that kind of uh, scare rhetoric is just terribly unfortunate. In 1982, then-Senator Joe Biden voted to let states overturn Roe v. Wade. A practicing Catholic, he said at the time, quote, I'm probably a victim or a product, however you want to phrase it, of my background. The bill never made it to the full Senate, but when it came back up the following year, he voted against it. Flip-flop over abortion would become a hallmark of his political career. However, with this leak, although not final, Democrats have embraced the opportunity to force an issue they believe is a political winner for them come November. Here's President Biden on Tuesday. 
concerns me a great deal that we're going to, after 50 years, decide a woman does not have a right to choose within the limits of, of the Supreme Court decision in case. These laws ban abortion after a particular gestational age based on sex, race, or genetic anomaly, ban specific abortion methods, impose biased counseling and waiting periods, require unnecessary ultrasounds, restrict access to medication abortions, limit who can provide abortion health care, and impose targeted regulation of abortion providers, quote unquote, trap regulations. In the past few years, fetal heartbeat bills have popped up in several states. At the top of 2019, Georgia, Kentucky, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Ohio adopted so-called fetal heartbeat bills that prohibit abortions after six weeks of pregnancy, which is usually the earliest that doctors can start detecting cardiac activity. Missouri also passed an eight-week ban, and Alabama voted to ban all abortions except to save a pregnant person life with no exception for rape or incest. On September 1st, Texas enacted SB 8, the strictest abortion law in the United States. It outlaws abortion as early as six weeks into a pregnancy, before many people even realize they're pregnant. Roughly 85% of abortions in Texas take place after that point. Now, clinics must turn away desperate patients. I'm going to be doing your ultrasound, okay? Mm -hmm. If we see any heartbeat whatsoever, we cannot proceed in the state of Texas, mm -hmm. okay? The law bans abortion once cardiac activity emerges, typically at around six weeks of pregnancy. But that's not exactly a heartbeat, because by that stage, the heart hasn't developed. So did you just find out you were pregnant? Yes. Your endometrium looks pretty thickened. However, I don't see a gestational sac growing yet. So that, to me, tells me that you're probably less than four weeks, okay? I'd like to run a pregnancy test mm -hmm. and see if you are pregnant. Mm -hmm. I can't support two, let alone go to work, do all that I need to do. I drove from Waco to come down here because they don't have any clinics that I could have seen to to, you know, deal with this. But knowing that I have to go all the way over here just to do what I need to do is kind of like, it's hard. <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah. Come in and talk to you a little bit about your chart. You're measuring at 6.1 weeks today, but we do see fetal cardiac activity on the ultrasound. So. As of September 1st in Texas, what that means is that you are ineligible to have an abortion in the state of Texas right now. Your next options would be traveling out of state to get the procedure done. I didn't even know that I was pregnant. I kind of just took a test. Wow. Just to see what, you know, what it would come out with. And I had a period. I try really hard to be strong for them. But every patient that I've told no today is like a gut punch. I've had women fall on their knees and beg. In the last never, week? Yes. I've never had that before. Because I had something to offer before we got to that. You know, I, I had a, a way out, or at least a hope that in a couple weeks we'll be able to knock this thing down. And under Roe v. Wade, all of these decisions are considered unconstitutional, though they will be upheld if Roe v. Wade is overturned. Amani Barbarin expounds on how these bills and abortion rhetoric affects disabled folks. In an article for Forbes titled, Heartbeat Abortion Bans Ignore Disabled People. Abortion access tends to be a testy topic in the disabled community for many reasons. Not the least among them is that both sides of the argument tend to use disabled people as weapons against the other. Anti-abortion advocates use disabled bodies as examples of botched abortions, and abortion rights advocates use disability as a reason why abortion is necessary in the first place. This can leave the disabled feeling as though no one is listening, but would rather push them back and forth in an attempt to one-up their opponent. 
There are many disabled people who want to be parents and able-bodied parents who want to carry a disabled child to term. To assume that abortion access is a cure-all for the existence of disability ignores the fact that disability is a natural aspect of the human experience. Abortion will not erase the existence of disability. Thinking so papers over the oppressive boundaries that society places on disabled people in favor of a homogeneous, easier future. People still need to put in the work of including disabled people in all levels of society and building systems of support and access that would make living in communities easier and the idea of raising a disabled child less daunting. Anti-abortion and pro-abortion rhetoric has always been violently ableist and that is rarely acknowledged. Disabled people are rarely considered in larger societal issues and that simply cannot continue. <sighs> and now we have to talk about religion because somewhere along the way anti-abortion rhetoric also became intertwined with Christian principles as many of our politics are, allowing people to use religion as their shield for their own inhumanity. Relating abortion to the act of sinning and going to hell is still a popular tactic of the holier than thou. A 1928 silent film titled The Road to Ruin is famously known for linking abortion and sin in a very absurd way. Sally is a 16-year-old New York City teen who, neglected by her parents, takes up smoking and drinking, engaging in affairs with a series of older men, gets arrested by the police during a strip poker game, is sent home only to discover later that she's pregnant. And after getting an illegal abortion, the words, the wages of sin is death, inexplicably appear over her bed in fire then she dies. Subtle. Though, surprisingly, it wouldn't be until the 1980s that anti-abortion rhetoric would become a hallmark of right-wing evangelicals. Francis Schaeffer, a college professor from Pennsylvania, largely influenced their vendetta against abortion today. When the Supreme Court legalized abortion in its landmark Roe v. Wade decision in January 1973, Protestant evangelicals did not protest. At that time, evangelicals were not yet politically involved on any major issue, but just a few years later, they were at the forefront of what became a four-decade conservative assault on Roe v. Wade, a bitter campaign that now appears to be on the brink of success, thanks in no small matter measure to Schaefer's efforts. It was through Schaefer's books, lectures, and films that he influenced American evangelicals. His book, How Should We Then Live, published in 1976, traced what he described as the decline of Western culture. He claimed the rise of secular humanism during the Renaissance had led to the corruption of Western civilization. In 1979, Schaefer turned his focus specifically to abortion. Six years after Roe v. Wade, he had come to believe there was no more powerful symbol of secular humanism than legalized abortion. And so he and C. Everett Koop, a born-again pediatric surgeon from Philadelphia, launched a four-month 20-city film and lecture tour based on their new anti-abortion book, Whatever Happened to the Human Race. While white conservatives and eugenicists may be mostly responsible for conjuring up such dehumanizing efforts, left-leaning folks have been just as influential in upholding the stigma. On both sides of our political system, politicians have made it their mission to pretty much only organize around abortions that occur in very traumatic circumstances, frequently listing rape, incest, and maternal mortality rates as reasons to legalize abortion. I personally believe relying so heavily on this form of messaging has only aided in further criminalizing certain people who obtain the procedure. It's become mostly widely accepted that abortion should be accessible, but when you ask most folks to expound on those beliefs, they tend to assert 
those very specific reasonings. If you ask the average person if they believe women should be able to have as many abortions as they want, I'd have to assume the responses would be much different. In line with white supremacist thinking, there's a looming sense of morality surrounding abortion access. Those who are victims of sexual assault and have become pregnant against their own will should absolutely, without a doubt, have access. But there's this simultaneous narrative of the women who are careless, who are making bad decisions with their bodies, which is often just a dog whistle for the marginalized. And for the people who make these bad decisions, they should be punished and not allowed to make decisions for their own bodies completely rooted in white supremacist patriarchal capitalism. Shout out to Tea with Queen and Jay. Patriarchy demands a sense of ownership over non-men's bodies and children. The stigma surrounding abortion is often tied to family shame and disgrace. Children are never protected in our legal system, and when it comes to reproductive health, that reality is no different. 26 states have laws on the books that require parental consent in order for a minor to terminate their pregnancy, creating huge obstacles for some young girls. In the 1979 Supreme Court case, Belodi v. Bayard, the courts ruled that states could insist that a minor obtain parental consent to obtain an abortion. The court, however, required that states provide a judicial bypass option where young people could petition a judge for permission to obtain an abortion without notifying their parents if they could show they were mature enough to make the decision on their own or that the abortion was in their best interest. Young people who get pregnant hide their pregnancies out of fear of how their families or significant others will react. A teen could be in a predicament where they want to terminate, but they know their family will prevent that from happening. There are also situations where the opposite is the case. In some households, you are told to not even think about having sex, let alone getting pregnant. Sometimes you're threatened, sometimes you're physically or emotionally abused, and those factors create a huge amount of fear for a young girl thinking about coming forward to ask for help. In too many states across the country, minors aren't afforded the privacy and safety necessary to make the best decision for them, and that's a problem. It's how young girls end up in situations where they seek out illegal abortions or attempt a self-managed one without the proper resources, information, or support. The various degrees of negative stigma go beyond just making people feel bad. It's a source of violence. It's a source of danger. Anti-abortion stigma is killing people now. It's criminalizing people now. That's why it's more important than ever to destigmatize it now. Changing our language from pro-choice and pro-life is important. You're either pro-abortion or anti-abortion. Pro-choice and pro-life tiptoe around the question of bodily autonomy, suggesting there's some validity in both schools of thought. One way to help drop the stigma is to let go of this passive language. We need to vocalize love and support for the people seeking abortions. More importantly, we have to start recognizing and supporting the many realities of abortion, from the casual to the violent. Sometimes abortions are no big deal. Sometimes they are. When we fail to hold space for all of those realities, we're committing ourselves to upholding this harmful stigma, a stigma that encourages us to pass judgment on pregnant people, only deeming some abortions appropriate or worth compassion. In part two, I'll be exploring how the media has approached the topic over the years. If you'd like to see the evolution of abortion on screen, please subscribe and engage with this video. If there are any abortion portrayals that have stuck out to you over the years in film and television, let me know in the comments below. So my channel just hit a thousand subscribers. <laughs> Um, I am overwhelmed <laughs> with appreciation. I honestly don't even know what to say because I was not expecting to hit this goal. My goal was to hit 500 subscribers by the end of August. So hitting a thousand um, in I think like half the time or less than half the time has been just 
very encouraging and I'm very very grateful um and I just really really want to thank everybody who has subscribed or engaged with my content um who has left thoughtful comments um I wish I could respond to them all but I like I, I can't <laughs> um but I'm going to try to respond to as many of them as I can sometimes it's easier to stay out of the comment section for me because sometimes people really do approach the comment section very very nastily I don't know if nastily is a word but yeah I don't appreciate that so I try to not spend too much time in the comment section and not get too riled up but I definitely appreciate and see the support um and the really sweet comments and i'm super grateful and i hope that we can continue to have really thoughtful conversations if you learned something new or you found my analysis illuminating don't be shy hit that like button I would love to be able to spend more time fleshing out complex ideas and the more support I have, the more I can bring quality videos to life. So thank you all so much for watching. I'll be making something somewhere at some point. I wish I wanted a kid. I wish I wanted one so bad because then this would be easy. I would be happy. I'd have Owen and my life wouldn't be a mess, but I don't. I need you to be there at six o'clock tonight to hold my hand because I am scared, Mayor, and sad because my husband doesn't get that. So I need you to.